The AAVMC acknowledges that Washington, D.C., the location of the AAVMC office, sits on the unceded sovereign territory of the Nekoshank, the, uh, also known locally as the Anacostans, the Piscataway, and the neighboring Pamunkey peoples. We pay respect to these nations, tribes, and communities, to their elders, past and present, to their descendants, to the generations to come, and to all indigenous peoples who came from this land. These individuals remain deeply connected to this land, to their communities, to their families, and to their culture. We recognize these ongoing relationships. We also acknowledge the foundational contributions that indigenous peoples here and globally have made to our understandings and advancements in science, medicine, and planetary health. We acknowledge and respect the thousands of years of indigenous knowledge and the ways of knowing that remind us that our health and the health of all beings on this planet are interconnected and interrelated. We encourage each of you to learn about and amplify the contemporary work of indigenous nations on whose land you are, you are on, and to endeavor to support indigenous sovereignty to be, to be more accountable to the needs of indigenous peoples in the ways that you can. And finally, we also recognize that many indentured, enslaved, and exploited peoples were forced to dedicate their labor on these lands. To these people and their descendants, we acknowledge their indelible mark on this space in which we gather for this event. Welcome to the AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an, oppor an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Dr. Lisa Greenhill and I'm the Senior Director uh, for Institutional Research and Diversity here at the AAVMC. So today we are talking about land acknowledgements. I open the show today with our new land knowledge and labor acknowledgement that was just adopted by the AABMC Board of Directors last month during our summer meeting in Philadelphia. In recent years, many organizations, institutions, and companies have adopted land, uh, native land acknowledgements and say them at the beginning of all kinds of different events. Um, while intended to be meaningful, many have become performative and or taken on kind of odd forms that do little to really advance the issues um, and our knowledge around um, tribal sovereignty, um, land issues, colonization, and recognition that indigenous people still exist, right, um, and much more. So today we're going to talk about all of this. Um, we're going to talk about land acknowledgements, why we do them, how we can make them more relevant to our work in general, and how we can also maybe talk about them in the context of veterinary medicine. So I am delighted to welcome my guests, uh, Drs. Evelyn Galbin from the University of Pennsylvania and Dr. Kenner, Kevin Leonard from Michigan State University. Both of these wonderful individuals um, were instrumental in the development of AABMC's updated acknowledgement. And so I am uh, publicly thanking you and also welcoming you to the show. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, Kevin. How you Hello. Doing? Hey. So as is our custom on the show, I like guests to tell a little bit about themselves. This will be Evelyn's second time on the show. <laughs> Welcome back. So we'll get started with you, Evelyn. Why don't you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself? Thank you. Um, so my name is Evelyn Galbin. That is my grandmother's name as well. Um, so I hope I am um, doing her proud. Um, I am Washoe and uh, Mona Lake Paiute. Um, I'm a neurologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Here, I'm the director of house officers. I'm also the associate medical director of the small animal hospital. Um, and I'm also the founder of the Native American Veterinary Association. Um, I just wanted to say, Pisha Yu, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. You have a lot of jobs there, Evelyn. <laughs> <laughs> just want to say. Just just take the hat off. Right? <laughs> the hat right, you got a lot of jobs. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so Kevin, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, 
awesome. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I'm really glad to be here as well. And uh, thank you for in including me in the development of the land acknowledgement you read at the beginning. Uh, my name is Kevin Leonard. I currently serve as the Assistant Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at MSU's or Michigan State University's College of Vet Med. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns. I've been at the university close to 25 years. I think I'm about four years away from my, my 25th anniversary of being here, but I have all three degrees from MSU. So I believe green and white. I'm, I'm a Spartan through and through. Um, no, the only thing I never was, was Sparty. I don't think I could fit in the suit. I'm, I'm too big. But uh, I, I just want to acknowledge that I'm also a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Um, you know, Chippewa is the English term, but we're, we're Ojibwe. That, that's the, the tribe. It's one of the three fire uh, confederacy tribes here in the state of Michigan that's made up the Odawa, Potawatomi, and, and Jibwa, Ojibwe. Um, I'd also like to introduce myself in, in my uh, given name, uh, my tribal name that was, was given to me. And it, uh, so I'd go Buju, Wapshka Mengen, Nadiznikaz, Megizi Dotum. And what I basically said is Boju is a formal greeting. You can say Ani as well. Ani is another way that's a little less informal. Uh, and then Wapshka Mengen is uh, White Wolf. Uh, Wapshka is white and, and Wolf is Mangan. And then the Giznikaz Megizi Dotum, it says my, my totem or my clan that I'm a member of is Eagle, Eagle Clan. And that comes from my father's side. Um, my son and I, uh, shortly after my father's passing, my father had his on his, uh, when, we, when we got notified that he was passing away, he asked for us to contact, you know, um, a healer to come down and give him his name. He'd been wanting to do that. And uh, unfortunately, you know, he was, diagnosed with cancer and it was terminal. So uh, his name is, um, uh, oh, I can't think of the word for black, but black wolf. Um, and uh, so when we went to the, the healer with my son and I got white wolf, I think my son, cause he has red hair, he thought he was gonna be red wolf. Uh, and unfortunately <laughs> no, he, he got, uh, he got uh, Misko Benishi, which is red bird, um, which, you know, again, the healer told him as you get older, you know, that can change, you can always come back and we can see, but. I think he was thinking that the, the wolf line would continue, but it didn't. <laughs> so I just thought I'd share that. Story. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you both for getting us uh, uh, started in this discussion. I really appreciated the conversations that we had in the development of the acknowledgement. And uh, so why don't we dive on in? So Kevin, I'm actually going to start with you. What is a land acknowledgement? So you know, when I read the question, I'm like, oh, I should look up the, the textbook definition. I'm like, nah, they already know what the textbook definition is. But in, in short, it's it's a way of acknowledging that the land that your, your institution sits upon, your business, where you're working, where you're presenting, if you're at a conference, you're acknowledging the, the people who came before, whose lands, you know, that they live there, they existed there, still, they still exist today, and that these lands weren't weren't just given that you know they were taken um and they were taken in in forceful ways and and many of our people were relocated and moved to reservations that were nowhere near the original ancestral ancestral places and land so uh, it's it's you know it's it's just a way to acknowledge that you know we realize that this is your land still and you'll see that you know this is indian land uh, we were just in chicago a few weeks back and we're in the uh, field museum and they have that exhibit which is a beautiful exhibit Exhibit that they have there on uh, in, in the indigenous people and it says you're on native land and I took a picture of that and you know it's, it's really powerful but that's that's the intent of what I see the land acknowledgement meaning um, you know again it has become performative as you said for some institutions but you know there's 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 way, ways around that yeah yeah so you know I can honestly say that it's only been in the last couple of years, really kind of after 2020, right? 2020, it was like a chunk of the world, because some of us already kind of had a clue, <laughs> but a good chunk of the world will kind of have this awakening. And um, certainly it was, uh, you know, a lot of it was sparked by the murder of George Floyd, but a lot of marginalized um, communities kind of really, really became incredibly vocal. And we also saw a lot of response um, from institutions, um, companies, organizations, um, really kind of trying to cobble together <laughs> statements of all kinds, not only for Black Lives Matter, but also at least at that point, 
um, maybe just a little before I kind of started to see more land acknowledgements. Um, they became a thing. And then certainly after um, that summer, the summer of activism, as I call it, um, we saw a lot more, right? So, you know, um, Evelyn, I'm going to ask you, like, why do you think that they've become so, I hate saying popular because it does feel like it trivializes it, but why did kind of everyone finally say, hey, you know, maybe we should collectively say this land is stolen. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I mean, I think even so in other areas of the world, right, these were already happening. So, I mean, that movement, that forward movement really started in Australia, New Zealand um, with the indigenous people there. And then in Canada, you know, they had um, um, their Truth and, Re and Reconciliation Act. And after that, you started to see more land acknowledgements in Canada. Um, and I think, you know, since 2020, people and I always want to think of this in the, the glass half full kind of way, people want to heal. They want to, mm -hmm. you know, we want to love one another. Um, and so this is a way forward. It is a way to say, yes, I'm recognizing the history. I'm acknowledging the history, but I'm also part of that history um, because I'm here in this space today. Um, and it's a way to heal that. Um, and I think hopefully... <laughs> <laughs> the greater number of people want that that healing process and it's a good way to do that it brings good feelings it brings great thoughts and creativity of how we can work together um and hopefully i think it's the way forward yeah yeah kevin anything to add no i think evelyn it hits it hits the nail on the head um you know i i had colleagues who, who actually traveled to new zealand and australia to to do some collaboration and work with the communities there and the indigenous communities and and that was things that they brought back is hey they're doing these acknowledgments this is something and and that was when i first heard it but i agree with you all also at least i think the real you know at least here in the united states the real push came you know after you know the, the murder of george floyd and and the pursuing you know rightfully so outcry that, that enough is enough uh, and I think it shook society enough that they started realizing that, hey, we, we need to, to wake up and acknowledge, you know, what, what's going on here and, and the systemic racism that still exists. Um, but, you know, I, I do think to some extent, you know, popular is there's also that 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 segment of, you know, we, we need to do it to check a box to say that we're that diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, place to work. Um, and and I, I hope that that's another place that we all work at. Um, but there's times that you do have to kind of check and, and hold hold them accountable because it can it can just kind of go in the back, fall to the back burner, say, yeah. well, we've said it. That's that's good. But, um, you know, I think both of your summations are, are, are really accurate and, and spot on to, you know, how, how we've come to be where we are today. Yeah. Yeah. There's also, you know, um, a huge Supreme Court case, at least in the U.S., that was kind of um, playing in the background pre-2020 um, um, about land, <laughs> specifically, um, and, and uh, land in Oklahoma. There was a, I mean, and I, you know, didn't, like, air quote, I hate to be this person, like mainstream media. Oh, my gosh. Now, like, now I'm like, people are going to be like, and I sound, but I listen to podcasts, everybody, people that know me closely know that I'm a podcast junkie and I discover the podcast, This Land, which highly recommended folks, um, really, really great, um, hosted by, uh, I think, Rebecca Nagel. She is a citizen of Cherokee Nation. Um, and she talks about kind of the lead up to the US um, Supreme Court case involving, um, it was a, a criminal case involving um, an, a, a, a murder that happened on um, tribal lands and who had jurisdiction. Um, and this, in 20, 2020 was a big year. 2020, the Supreme Court <laughs> um, basically said, you know, um, yeah, all of this land, um, a lot of Tulsa um, does not belong to air quote Oklahoma, it belongs to Cherokee Nation. Um, and I think that they're kind of still sorting out kind of what does that mean, but it really also that kind of kind of came into um, play at least 
in my mind, all of that is kind of conflated together with kind of these land acknowledgements in that case and then the activism that year. Um, because that the decision actually came down right around the same time <laughs> that um, the protests were starting because of course the, the Supreme Court ends its calendar year in the end of June. And so it was one of the last decisions that was announced that year. Um, and it was just, I mean, I highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about unceded territory and treaties and the backstory and all of that good stuff, this, is, uh, this land is a great podcast to do that. Yeah, yeah. So my next question then is, you know, is this, you know, the other thing uh, out of, you know, the last couple of years is, um, you know, decolonize, decolonize education, decolonize this, decolonize that, da, 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 da. So in acknowledging <laughs> me. our essentially stolen lands, um, is this a form of decolonization, um, you know, and haha, is it enough? That's kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> that last one. <laughs> I mean, I, I always like to think of these as a beginning. It's a beginning to the conversation. It's a start. Um, and and I like, I mean, if I think about decolonization and how I like to frame that, I think it's a like it's a recentering, right? It's like recentering mm -hmm. on the indigenous knowledge, the relationship to the land um, and these land acknowledgements, it's a beginning to that. It's saying like, let's refocus where we are, learn about, you know, the sort of colonial history, um, but frame it correctly. And when the acknowledgement is done well, it can be a good start. Yeah. I think that's spot on. Good start. I think that's that's the best we can say. It's it's a good start because, again, if that's all it is, if you know, if that's all you do as an institution or a business, um, or even just an individual, you know, because I know I've heard individuals who present at different conferences, you know, just say it, you know, representing themselves as a speaker. If that's all you've done and you do nothing else, then that's that's it. That's all we can say is, you know, it is. It, we haven't decolonized nothing. Um, but it is a good start. I, I think what I see it as is a, is a tool to start then to be able to hold those institutions that adopt those as their their policy or officially adopt them to hold them accountable to say okay you say these at graduation at commencement at, at all these different events it's but what are you doing you know and, it, and, it, and it's that is that opportunity I think for us to start then you know offering ways to decolonize something that that is very again you know, it's, it's going to be tough. And, and part of it is because even we ourselves, you know, have to break through uh, as indigenous people, some of the colonization effects that we've all suffered. That's part of that trauma that, that our people mm. have dealt with the generations. I mean, you know, we're, 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 we're coming up, I think on the, um, here in September, uh, with the orange shirt day, basically acknowledging, you know, the, the indigenous, the, the native boarding schools, the Indian boarding schools, but the, the damage that's done to communities throughout Canada and, and the United States is just irreparable. And, you know, a lot of that is again, you know, kill the Indian and, and replace them with, you know, someone who doesn't know their language, doesn't know their culture, you know, and, and goes back and then perpetuates white, white culture, you know, and they become the colonizer themselves. And that's, that's tough. Um, you know, and I have, you know, as someone who's did not grow up in a very, I mean, I grew up knowing I was native. That was something my, you know, my family was, we were, but we didn't grow up on a reservation. So I wasn't surrounded by the culture. And, and my grandmother um, had basically avoided boarding schools by running into the woods of Canada with her family to, to basically avoid being taken. But my, my great grandmother was here in boarding school and up in Mount Pleasant. Um, and, you know, just the languages, the culture, everything that she forgot, um, you know, that was hypothetically be beaten out of her and taken from her. We weren't taught that. So it wasn't passed on to the next generation of kids. So we have a, a gap in our knowledge of our own culture and identity that we get back from attending our cultural events and, and talking to, to people in our community who were able to, to have those. And, and again, not have those without fight or or persecution because they 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 had to fight and, and face a lot of persecution just to maintain the ability to practice their their religious beliefs and 
that that's that's something that I value that we still have elders and, and traditional healers and, and people in our community that can pass that on because I've tried to suck in as much of it as possible. You know, I always grew up being pride in my proud of my heritage and my tribe, but I there was a lot of things when I hit 18, when I hit college, I didn't know. Um, in that I, I had to to learn by you know, immersing myself with within the communities that I didn't necessarily have the access to when I was when I was growing up. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You know, we um, also did in the working group that um, helped put together our um, AABMC's um, new acknowledgement, um, our colleague, uh, Dr. Jamie Gangara from University of Sydney participated. And you know, even when we talk about saying um, these acknowledgements, there was a really great point that um, he made that, you know, as folks who identify as, um, you know, if you are welcoming folks to your meeting, um, you know, the land acknowledgement is not your welcome. Like it's it's an acknowledgement, right? Um, if you're welcoming people and you want to welcome people specifically to this location, then you need to, um, you know, ask an indigenous person to welcome you. That is the role that, um, you know, that they, they do in Australia. And I, I thought that that was really interesting. Um, otherwise, you know, as folks who do not identify as indigenous, um, you know, we uh, acknowledge the land that we're on. And it was really an interesting um, distinction. And, and he talked a lot about, um, you know, how they kind of have come to this place. And, and to your point um, earlier, Evelyn, you know, it is in part because um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and certainly Canada have had these kind of truth and reconciliation, um, you know, commissions, groups. Um, and, and I think that, you know, uh, as an American, <laughs> we, I would love to see that, but we got a lot of truth and a lot of reconciliation that we need to do. I'm not sure how many commissions we need, but we need a lot of them, right? And so, um, you know, I thought that this idea of, um, you know, infusing meetings and kind of starting meetings, recognizing having this moment of acknowledgement um, is, is really important. But again, we know that like now I go to meetings sometimes and it's like, you know, Okay, so we said the thing, let's move on. Yeah, let's let's go. Versus I go to a meeting, say, for example, like NCOR, which is National Conference on Race and Ethnicity and um, American Higher Ed, and the land acknowledgement is runs about an hour because it's an entire presentation. There's a procession, there's flags, there's drumming, there's singing, there's a talk, uh, a mini talk, and then there's a recessional and, and these types of things. And it was so deeply moving um, as a way to kind of start a program. But, you know, um, uh, uh, we have this gung-ho work ethic <laughs> in the US that says we gotta get it, get it moving. So, you know, how can we make them, um, how can we make these acknowledgements less performative? You said that they are a great beginning, but how can we make them less performative? And, and what are some of the ways that we can take action. Kevin? Yeah, you know, I think you had asked that in, in one of their conversations through the, through, <laughs> I give you like a litany. I'm like, oh, I'm on that co conversation right now with someone. I mean, I give you a whole long list of, of things, but um, it, it, it can, it can take place in, in, in multiple, multiple ways. But you know, the first and foremost, with institutions of higher education, you have to you have to be strategic, and you're going to have to be intentional in trying to recruit more. If you want more students, you have to be very strategic and very intentional in what you're doing. Um, and same with faculty and, and staff. So that's one of the areas that you can, you know, work on is how do we expand our native, you know, um, or indigenous identifying faculty and staff. How, and, and, and one of the issues with Indian country is then making sure that they are indigenous. Uh, Cause you know, as you know, in your community and, and, and others, we have those who, who like to, you know, make believe or, or say that they are, they are other, but you know, it's, it's important that we, we do things as institutions to start 
you know, effectively trying to reach out and recruit more. And then once they're here, make sure that we have environments that are supportive of them. Yeah. Um, so instead of, you know, celebrating like our institution moved away from celebrating Columbus and we, we have an Indigenous Peoples Day uh, here at Michigan State University and our state has moved away um, from, from celebrating that and celebrating an Indigenous uh, Peoples, Peoples Month as well. Um, you know, having having affinity groups and, and making sure that they have the resources that other affinity groups have, even if they're five people, because that's sometimes it's like, well, you know, there's 60 of them and there's no pie. I, you know, that's one of the things that stop making believe that there's some pie that everybody's got to have just a percentage of based upon their population. Like, let's just all have the resources we need to do what we need to do to, you know, support our students, support our faculty, support our staff. Um, you know, those are just some of the, the things up front, um, you know, acknowledging the holidays, understanding that, you know, there are different religions within each of the tribes. There's 500 different tribes across the United States. We don't all have the same same beliefs and, and, and you know, shared shared belief system um, and what we, you know, find acceptable in, in one um, community, we may not in another. And it's important that we don't just say, well, that that person's native and they said this is okay. So it must be okay. Well, no, <laughs> not any more than you speak for the entire white race. Do I speak for all indigenous peoples everywhere? So, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from my perspective and, you know, even within my community, I, I grew up in, you know, we're, the mascot issues is, is a big thing mm -hmm. right now, you know, and, you know, we finally got a Washington football team to change their name and Cleveland to change theirs. But we still have a lot of high schools in our state here in Michigan, yeah. uh, in mind being one of them that, you know, we used to be called the Red Raiders. They dropped the red and the Raiders, but we still have a native, you know, that's our, yeah. that's our logo. But we have a lot of indigenous people in, you know, that are, are same members of my tribe and our community who don't see a problem with that. But, you know, the conversation is, Again, they don't speak for all Indigenous people everywhere. And as a whole, our communities are saying these things, you know, are, are hurting our, our youth yeah. and are hurting our people. So we need to do something differently to change it. Um, but yeah, those are just some of the things that, that fall off the top of my head. Right. I could go on, I'll stop. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I tend to ramble sometimes. No, it's great. It's great. <laughs> Evelyn, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I would say in terms of like the, performative um, piece to it I, and to bring in you know what you were talking about before where um, there is a difference between having an indigenous person welcome people to the area and help and, and really be part um, of a presentation or an opening um, is one thing but to um, have a native person perform the land acknowledgement mm -hmm. um, is often what uh, sort of gets asked of us or um, sometimes it, you know, it happens. Um, I think that makes it a performance. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of like the organization, when they are developing their land acknowledgement, I think it is a, it's a great opportunity. Someone might be sitting in the audience having never heard the term land acknowledgement, and this might be the first time that they're going to hear it. Um, and that is a tremendous opportunity for growth for both the organization and for the person in the audience. Um, so to really use this moment to provide that education is, is tremendous. Um, and it makes it very much so more meaningful than sort of the box checking that we all kind of cringe um, when we hear. Um, so using the time to, to maybe give an example that the institution is doing. This is what we are doing today. This is what we would like to do as a goal in our future. And being very specific about what those goals are is helpful. And then I think, you know, as we are most of us educators, part of that is getting people to participate as well. So giving them the time in that acknowledgement to sit and think, how can, how can I do the same thing as an individual? not just, you know, part of the organization, but how am I going to grow individually and what can I personally do? And then, you know, giving those examples because you know, not everyone is going to know how they can be a part of it or like, you know, how do my strengths fit into this goal? Right. Um, yeah. I think that may, really making it and owning it um, makes it less of the box checkering. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for both of you. Um, Kevin, it was so funny when you were saying, yeah, well, you know, the, the, we have this thing in our country, everybody's a princess, right? 
Everybody's a princess. <laughs> Halloween is coming. Do not buy those outfits. Everybody's a princess. Uh, you know, the Senator Warren notwithstanding, right? <laughs> so like right. Yeah, no, and, and, it, and it's it's challenging, you know, it it, it is. Um because I'll I had to check my cousin one year <laughs> you know we're, we're his brother his dad is my dad's brother I mean we share the same blood quantum the whole nine yards we're you know we grew up in the same communities he actually grew up just a few miles down the road from from our, our tribal community up in uh, the upper peninsula but I, I saw a picture of him roll across my Facebook page you know and, and basically what was an Indian costume like dude like I'm, I'm like you don't dance that's not your regalia you, you can't and he said, yeah, but I'm native. I said, nah, nah. that's just not right. <laughs> um, so yeah, he and I had to sit down in a long conversation about because he, he didn't fully grasp it until I said, you know, I said, we're, we're, you're playing, you're playing what you are. And it's not, it's not healthy. You know, it's not healthy for, for, for you or our communities and, and for our youth to see that um, because, you know, it's, it's harmful, but um, yeah, it, it's out there. I, I appreciate Evelyn what, what you're saying. I, I think that that is one of the things we've we've joked oftentimes here at Michigan State that we get asked to read it. I'm like, we're not the ones that need to be reading it. Like we we know what it is. Like get somebody else to read it. And, and again, I think that's exactly it. You know, if you want us to, you know, get a community member to welcome them who who is, you know, this is their their community and their land, that's a whole different ballgame. And I think that that is that is a good way to look at things as well. Um, one of the other things I want to share before I know you go yeah. to the next point is how within our communities is just the misinformation that exists, you know, in our in our history books and that's perpetrated K through 12 and, it, and it's still even in the in the university system, um, you know, about <laughs> everything from Thanksgiving all the way through, you know, and I remember the history books I got, I think we got two pages of, well, you know, people came over, there was some, you know, people here, and there, but there wasn't many of them, and, and we, we chit-chatted, and uh, we had them over to dinner, and, and well, then, oh, look at, we're into the modern area that, you know, we're making automobiles, and it's like, well, well what, what happened, and when you start to really look at that, and, and um, uh, I think it's uh, the whitewashing of American history lies that my teacher told me. I, I'm trying to remember the author of that, but um, you know, it's a it's it's a lengthy and a hard read. Uh, I ain't going to tell you that's an easy easy read. I think even on audiobook, it's like thirty some hours of audiobook to to listen to. But uh, it it really breaks down a lot of the misconceptions, and I, I have them myself. You know, because again, we were raised in a you know colonized you know white. Society history um and and i would i would encourage people to to check that book out but i'd also just say in general try to find you know some of the true history about the, the founding of our country you know it's not all it's not all flowers and roses i mean it's, yeah. it, there's a lot of um brutality in it and uh, unfortunately yeah. that's not how we paint it and i know that that's part of the um I think they call it, you know, the heroizing or the grandizing of of our of our founders. Yeah. But um, we we need we need to we need to check that. It still doesn't mean we can't be great, but right. we have to go right. that history. We can still be great and be honest. And be right? honest. That's and, my opinion. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that gets to the heart of um, you know a lot of the discourse that we're talking about, um, and you know, across U.S. society at least, kind of. How do we teach history? Whose history gets taught and how does it get taught? To your point, you know, it was like, oh yeah, we came here, the Nina, the Santa Maria, like I'm a native Virginian. So like, you know, here comes the boat, like, you know, (laughs) and oh, by the way, like, poof, there was slavery. And then this other thing happened and, you know, (laughs) it was like, okay, but wait a minute, (laughs) you know, and oh, by the way, there were people who lived here. And, and it is hard. And I would say it's particularly challenging for, um, for indigenous and, and African-American communities in the Southeast because there was the first point of first contact. There is a lot of intermingling. Like for example, both of my grandmothers um, were indigenous. I don't typically identify because one, I didn't have the cultural, cultural touchstones and two, this is how I walk through the world and how I'm presenting, right? And so, um, and so it ends up getting complicated, but we can do hard things. <laughs> like, <laughs> people chew gum and walk all the, all the time. <laughs> like, like we're blasting people in this space. We can figure this thing out, right? It's not, it's not that hard. 
Right. It's not that hard. So I do have a question from the chat um, uh, from Dr. Uh, Mia Carey. And um, she is, her question is, is it recommended that speakers customize their land acknowledgements based on where they are speaking or share theirs based on where they have their home work, home or work base? My recommendation is the, the land upon which you're standing when, when you give it. Um, for, for So if you're in Oklahoma and you're acknowledging the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and uh, Odawa people, cool, but that's not whose land you're, you're currently on. And, and even understanding Oklahoma, because that was the relocation for so many tribes from the east, that's really not where they were from either, because the tribes there were even pushed farther west. So, right. but um, yeah, I, my recommendation would be do the research of, of the area you're going to be in, you know, in, incorporate that tribe's you know, names and make sure that you pronounce or do your best to pronunciate the tribe's names the, the way that, that you should. Um, that, that, that's just my thought. Uh, and, and, I, and I share that because I had a, one of our um, alumni from the College of Vet Med was doing a presentation in Chicago and wanted to do an acknowledgement. And I just sat down with them to kind of work on what it was, but I, I, I let them do the research on who's, you know, where that was and whose land it was that they were going to be on. And then we worked together to incorporate it into something that they were comfortable with in, in sharing. Um, and, and I think that's to me just the best way because it acknowledges the people where you're at versus where you're from. And, and that to me is the intent of a land acknowledgement. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I am dropping um, uh, native-land.ca into the chat. That is what we use. Um, and I can just tell you my own practice, um, um, even for virtual, often for virtual meetings, I use um, the DC um, uh, metropolitan area. And often I also try to um, incorporate um, an acknowledgement for the place that I am actually going to be speaking to. I think that it's important, um, you know, and virtually, and we can we can do both, right? We can do both. Um, but it, at a minimum, I do where 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 I, my fanny is sitting at any given time. So great question. So. Um, all right, here gets here gets into the real nitty gritty. What makes, we're going to start with the, the, the bad stuff, despite the fact that Evelyn has a wonderful, positive outlook on all of this stuff. What makes a bad acknowledgement? <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> no, I've been talking too much. I'm going to let Evelyn go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Well, you know it when you hear it. Um, if it. If you're giving a statement that is, uh, very brief and is a recognition only of the past, um, such that it might be received as there were people here, then they were gone. You know, they, they, they did live on this land, but now they don't. Um, that's, that's a bad statement. <laughs> it's, it's avoiding the whole purpose. So, yeah. yeah. Um, a statement that is only about the past is, is not really what we're trying yeah. to achieve. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one. Um, uh, so making them active, um, that people are still around, <laughs> and there are some people who have, you know, um, come back. Right. Um, also recognizing that um, um, there are tribes that are not federally recognized. So be mindful when you are doing acknowledgments to. Um, know whether or not there are tribes that are not on, you know, air quote, the big list, right? Because that's not the only list. Um, again, I, I mentioned that I'm from um, Central Virginia. Um, the whole Pocahontas story, like the one they teach you in school, not true. Like, <laughs> like let that go. <laughs> and also she didn't marry, what was that name? That guy's name? John, no, uh, Captain somebody. I don't, she didn't marry him. She married John, John Rolfe, <laughs> right? She married John Rolfe and he swept her off to England and she died of smallpox. But aside from that, like, even when we talk about the history of this figure who America has kind of, icona, you know, made an icon for indigeneity, um, the stories about her typically aren't still about her. They're about the white men 
in her life, <laughs> right? Who um, essentially took over her destiny, right? Whatever she would have become, um, um, you know. So, so making sure that you keep indigenous people centered mm-hmm. in the acknowledgement. Um, you don't need to acknowledge anybody else but the indigenous people in an acknowledgement. Now, so what I'm saying and, and not saying here is that uh, about a year and a half ago, um, uh, a colleague came to me and, and we were t- helping stu- some students with a land acknowledgement and they brought in um, a, uh, an acknowledgement from <clears throat> an institution that shall not be named, unless somebody wants to name it, um, but they brought an institution that shall not be named. And it, the, 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 the land acknowledgement actually centers the narrative on this white individual who colonized the like you know the the, the area like it, it was kind of baffling to me don't do that that's bad don't like we'll just leave it there just don't do that <laughs> don't do that so what makes a good uh acknowledgement I think what the opposite of what Evelyn said, you know, that that still talks about this is a present present day issue yeah. versus just all all history. Um, you know, I, I think for one of the things that we we have what we call a, a land acknowledgement, but it's it's provisional because we really haven't put it and vetted it the way we as a community feel it needs to be. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to wrap up this summer is we did get it in the tribe's hands. We, we sent it to all the, the, the chair people of all of our uh, 12 federally recognized tribes in the state to have them look at it. We sent them a couple of reminders. Um, we didn't really get any feedback. Uh, we went to United Tribes. They gave a little feedback. We edit it. We're going to bring it back on campus. And the goal is <clears throat> to be truthfully acknowledging who it should, we need to be including those individuals in the conversation. And we've tried to do that. And I I know our tribal communities are extremely busy with a lot of things and they don't necessarily have the time, but usually if they disagree with something, they're gonna let you know. So I'll I'll take some of the fact that we didn't get any real blowback or pushback saying, oh, you can't say that, or you can't include this as, you know, they're they're not necessarily sanctioning it, but they they definitely, I think are okay with how it's written. And we try to make it inclusive along the lines of what you said, Lisa, is, to make sure that it's not just those 12 federally recognized tribes, because we have other tribes here in our state that are still struggling for recognition. And and we have other people who live in the state who we were relocated here. Their tribes aren't here, but they still are here. And this is now the land upon which they live. So we have tried to work that into the wording of our our land acknowledgement that we're, we're looking to have, you know, brought into policy here in the next few months by the university um, to make sure that everybody's included. And it's as inclusive as possible of re- acknowledging and recognizing those individuals that are still here. Um, you know, those those are some of the things that I think what makes a makes a good land acknowledgement. It's not by any means the the exhaustive list, but yeah, sure, sure. If it doesn't sound right, don't do it. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Right. So, so um, I do have a, just a few more questions before we begin to wrap up. And you know, one of the things that we're also seeing um, in these recent years is across higher ed, a lot of institutions are recommending that faculty include land acknowledgments in their syllabi. And um, you know, now we know everybody who's a faculty knows you can't make faculty do <laughs> what faculty don't want to do, but it's oftentimes strongly encouraged, right? Heavy on the air quotes for folks that are listening instead of watching. Um, And so, you know, um, we are starting to see litigation about this where um, there was a a faculty member at the University of Washington who um, included (laughs) a really bizarre kind of statement and his land acknowledgement and basically if you're into econ, yay, econ people, right? Um, he basically said that, you know, according to, you know, Locke's theory of labor, like, okay, well, these people didn't do anything with this land. So we're going to acknowledge that they didn't do anything with this land. And we came in and took and, and saved the land, right? Um, and University of Washington was like, oh, no, that is so not what we meant. <laughs> Don't do that. Bad faculty, bad, bad. And now he's he's suing, um, you know, on First Amendment 
grounds. And so, um, you know, I, I, I would I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on, you know, recommendations to faculty to include these kinds of statements um, in their syllabi. I, I was fascinated um, by the, the press that came about and, and that professors, um, you know, response to what was going on. I think, and I have his quote here. He said, land acknowledgements are performative acts of conformity that should be resisted, even if it lands you in court. And I thought, there's a great statement to show he has no idea what a good land acknowledgement is, right? I mean, they're, they're not gonna be the same for an institution, for an individual, that there are moments their opportunity for personal growth. And, and so therefore they, it's not making you do what everyone else is doing. It's asking you to resolve this and heal from this on your own. And yes, we're gonna do it together as an institution. And sure, we'd love for these academic institutions to promote it. Um, but I think he's really mi missed the whole point of doing or accepting a land acknowledgement. Um, I, I would like to think that instead of the academic institutions having to say, put this in your, you know, syllabi or, or, you know, giving people exactly what they should say, that it does become something you want to do because you want to go through this personal journey, um, that you want to heal, um, and that good things are going to be coming from it. And that good feeling is going to be infectious. So people will want to do it um, mm -hmm. and talk about it and have that conversation. Again, mm -hmm. that's me like, being very positive and loving and hoping that that's what's going to happen. Um, but yeah. Kevin, anything to add? That, I, to me, that's, that's it spot on. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you, you summed it up <clears throat> really well, Evelyn. And, and Lisa, I think you're right. We can't force faculty and the academic freedom, you know, <laughs> to do anything they don't want to do. Um, it, but I think it's funny that you take a recommendation. Again, it wasn't a requirement, maybe and strongly encouraged, but you take it and you just, you're that offended by it, that, that you feel you have to, to write what he did and just but again i think it it, it does show an example also just uh, the um, the misinformation you know that yeah. this land was just sitting vacant you know says volumes i mean that's the whole premise of you know what the pilgrims came over and settlers all did is you know there's nobody using this and it's god's that what was what it what's the word for that you know the, destiny. <laughs> destiny and we can just grab it all there were billions of people here but before I and mean, it wasn't even before the there is like disease was brought in by vikings and who knows how many i mean there's even people who traveled from the continent of africa over yeah. here before the vikings that set foot and our people our people believe we were here from the beginning of the time even though others would argue that we came across land bridges and the whole night. and we can argue all that but just to believe that this the you know again the privilege that goes with this belief that this was just laying here unused that nobody was putting it to to good use is just you know marvelous and even when you read some of the stuff about when when the the pilgrims came about cleared fields and stuff like what do you think cleared those <laughs> you know that, that corn wasn't just growing there with the squash and stuff it's just they may not be there anymore but it's not because they left or they were never there it's because yeah. disease devastated yeah. the population by the time we got to to that I mean you know 1400s to the point in time the pilgrims came disease just devastated most yeah. of the population of, of the you know north america that was here because <clears throat> there's arguments about how many millions it was versus mm. hundreds of thousands and yeah. it, it was tens of millions i mean we had cities and villages and trade routes from florida all the way up to you know to the to the midwest and east coast west coast and you know, and how do you know that? Well, because you find people buried with shells and items that you can only get in certain regions. You know, how did that get there? You know, so this idea that we were just sitting here in our own little plots and just chilling out, and yeah, I just think is laughable. But um, yeah, I, I think there, 
again, there's always going to be pushback change for anything, you know, doesn't come without a fight. Nobody's, nobody's giving us anything and we have to just continue to do that. And, and I think keep the positive mind of Evelyn of just, there will be people and enough people yeah. will outnumber those with ill intent or just who just can't see that this isn't being done to force anything. It's being done to heal and help bring all of us forward together, not leave any behind or push anybody down. Um, you know, because that's the other thing is that this isn't, in, you know, intended when, when I read this is intended to, to shame or bring anything. It's just say, hey, you need to think about this differently than you do right now that, yeah. you know, um, and, you know, the, that these are sovereign. And that's the other thing is just helping people understand sovereignty. And I, I forgot to mention that early on. Mm -hmm. This idea that, you know, we're not just a race of people. We're also sovereign people kind of boggles people's mind because they're like, well, if we do that for you, we're going to have to do that for, you know, the, the, the black fact and we have to do it for the Latinx fact and Asian. Well, I'm like, oh, technically no, because we're sovereign because we're government to government relations. So, because uh, you don't sign treaties with people, you sign them with, with governments. And, you know, so it, that even opens up a door when we have these land dollars, but to those kind of conversations, because that, I, I'm, I'm not an expert. You know, we have people, you know, in our community that are experts in, in tribal law and in, in you know, can go into detail, but just know enough that treaties aren't signed between individuals, they're signed between governments and that they carry, they carry a lot of weight. Yeah. Um, and thankfully we've had people in our community who went, you know, here in Michigan and um, were able to get the tuition waiver because one of the treaties that the government signed said uh, you would educate our, our kids in firm perpetuity. And it didn't say K through 12, it said everything. So we got the public mm -hmm. and then we get the Michigan tuition waiver for, for our public colleges and universities. So awesome. yeah, you know, you know, we, awesome. we use, we use that, that law right back and yeah. we need more of that. So yeah. Those treaties are important. Yep. So, so what are some of the ways that we can practice, um, you know, restorative justice um, with and for indigenous communities? And, and what role does veterinary medicine have to play? You know, and, and before you jump in, I do want to um, add that one of the reasons that you know, we looked to rewrite and expand our acknowledgement was because, you know, <clears throat> one, the land piece just felt a bit performative to us. And two, um, I think that we also recognize the role that um, indigenous knowledge and, um, and ways of knowing, which for me is a huge thing, is how kind of epistemology piece is really um, intriguing to me, but we wanted to acknowledge that, um, you know, the foundations of what we understand about um, science and medicine and math and STEM in general, um, and so many other things as well, come from indigenous knowledge globally, not just in the States, but just globally, right? Um, if we're talking about, um, you know, um, uh, continental Africans coming to visit um, before the Vikings. Well, the Vikings, um, you know, certainly they were indigenous to that region. They were doing all kinds of cool stuff, but, you know, there were groups that came even before that and they had their own indigenous knowledge. I will also admit that they didn't like, you know, stay, but <laughs> they were like, oh, we have potatoes, you have potatoes, let's go home um, and, and swap some things, right? But so you see those trade routes pieces, but but this, this idea that um, there was more than just land that we needed to express, um, one, that we acknowledge it, and two, some gratitude as well, because we couldn't do what we do without some of that foundational knowledge. And so for us, it was, um, um, you know, we, we wanted it to be more, the labor acknowledgement also was that we wanted to acknowledge not just in um, folks that have historically been enslaved, but I mean, numerous people, at least in this country and certainly all over the world have been indentured, enslaved and exploited in a number of different ways. And we thought that that was important to acknowledge as well. Um, so having said all of that, um, you know, what are some ways that we can be um, more mindful and practice, um, you know, the requisite justice that I think these communities deserve? And what can we do in vet med? 
I think vet med has a tremendous opportunity um, to really invite the indigenous people of the area, the area that the school is around to teach. There is a tremendous body of knowledge, um, whether that's about, um, you know, Lisa, as we were viewing that movie, um, the documentary Gather, yeah. right? That provided so many opportunities, just watching that one film for discussion around helping native communities with food sovereignty. So, um, you know, whether that's helping to um, reinvigorate the buffalo herds or whether that's through fisheries and um, fish management. I mean, there are so many opportunities out there that could really get a lot of great experience with, you know, veterinary academic institutions and the people who are around them. Mm -hmm. um, there's also other opportunities for, you know, underserved <coughs> communities and them needing the, the care. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the art has a lot to say also. <laughs> You're not paying attention to me. <laughs> no, no, <right? laughs> like I can definitely talk about food right now. <laughs> um, but, you know, sort of doing the research when you're making your acknowledgement about what your local communities are doing and how can you help um, provide the, those paths to work together. Um, it's a it's a great opportunity. Okay. Okay. What do you think yeah, to add? I, I know we're short on time. You know, when I when I came to to the College of Vet Med from the College of Business, it was rude awakening because I think a lot of people think that in vet med all you do is take care of puppies and kitties, and it's such a expansive field that has it's you know it's touch on everything that we see and do you know from the food we eat to the vaccines we have to stay healthy comes through this this field of study and when they start talking about one health i'm like oh yeah one health yeah everything's connected yeah I'm, i fully understand you know and i was like yeah you guys didn't come up with that i, I hate to tell you you know that you know because our, our belief in a lot of communities you know is the the what happens to to the animals the wolves the environment will eventually happen to us so mm -hmm. you know if the wolf disappears eventually we will disappear here um you know it was kind of that that philosophy so that you know that's important to acknowledge you know as you said that the science of what we know isn't something you created it's existed that indigenous way of knowing is there and i think bringing our community members in our our gatherers and and our healers to talk about you know some things that we know to be true um that may not be in the textbooks would be really a nice way to acknowledge that and definitely is not performative in any way shape or form uh, one other thing we need to do and something i you know i'm proud of our our university for at least making steps towards i had been advocating for some time for tuition reciprocity this idea of borders is something we you know is not wasn't here we we Canada, the United States, we went across the river and it's like, nah, hey, we're in Canada. We were still on our land. We were just on the other side of the river. And, you know, to me, allowing people to come from Canada and from Indiana and Texas and Alaska and different places to attend at least at in-state rates of tuition is, is something I think you could easily do to, to make one coming to your institution more attractive, but just pay acknowledgement to those, those tribal people that we we know this is all of your land and that the borders are, are man-made and they're not they're not what you're used to uh and, and if possible like i know um we have the tuition waiver here as a state but uh i think out in arizona they i think university of arizona adopted their own michigan tuition waiver where they said nobody it's not a state policy it's we're making a policy for any of the tribes of our state that their kids can come here tuition free I would love to see our institutions, you know, throughout, you know, the United States do that, or, or just even our vet colleges, you know, yeah. can you imagine doing a tuition discount or a free tuition to, to come for indigenous people? That'd be phenomenal. Yeah, those are great, great suggestions. Thank you. And yes, there are um, a number of programs. So uh, the new college at University of Arizona, College of Veterinary Medicine is certainly doing um, <clears throat> some work to make sure that um, indigenous knowledge is included in the curriculum, definitely check them out. And uh, University of Sydney's um, Faculty of Veterinary Sciences um, has a 
whole program. It's fascinating. It's so well developed. I'm so jealous. Um, but Dr. Uh, Gangora at um, University of Sydney's Veterinary School um, leads that program and has just done some really amazing work. They even have rotations um, where they take students um, to the outback and they take students to, to go work with Aboriginal um, populations and really kind of talk about not just like, oh, they need help, but here's, you know, this is the situation, this is the history, this is why, um, you know, they are underserved. Like this is a problem of our own making, <laughs> not their making, it is the problem, a collective problem that we have created um, as colonizers. And um, they really do some amazing work to help students um, really kind of understand um, and be able to be prepared to work with those populations. So they're increasing cultural humility and cultural competence as well. And, and those are um, certainly skills that will benefit them throughout their career, no matter what they're doing. So as we um, wrap, any other burning things that either of you feel is necessary to, to comment on before we depart? Well, just want to say thank you for having this session. It was it was enjoyable. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for having me. I just want to say again, all of this is is for the positive to move forward to heal. Um, so hopefully, it's not bringing about any terrible feelings, uh, guilt, shame. It's really to heal and to move forward together. Yes. Great point. Thank you so much for that, Evelyn. Um, I have dropped a number of uh, resources into the live chat, but they will be included in the formal show notes. Some of those resources include um, a link to the This Land podcast, which was really, really great um, and kind of can give you uh, some, some background on kind of um, land issues, um, treaty issues, because one of the big things was um, in that in the Supreme Court case was, well, nobody set aside the treaty and the treaty says this belongs to them. <laughs> so we're just going to uphold the treaty. All right. And so, um, you know, even reading the, uh, the majority decision was just really fascinating. Um, I have included a link to the Orange Shirt Day, um, which I didn't really know much about. So I'll be looking um, forward to that and, and the, also the Native Lands Map. So, oh, and the Gather. Um, uh, documentary, which we featured in our uh, Indigenous Peoples Film Festival last fall, which AAVMC co-hosted with the Native American Veterinary Association. And uh, thank you so much for that, Evelyn. That was great. So thank you um, to my guests, Kevin and Evelyn. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. This has been another episode of AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air. Um, be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and like us on Facebook at AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air, where I am and my colleagues are always posting all kinds of um, articles, um, uh, stories, tools, uh, all kinds of good stuff. So be sure to check us out there and uh, stay tuned for the next show, which will be happening in a few weeks. Thanks so much and have a great evening. Thank you.